Um, hi, hi, Kenyon. Thank you so much for joining um, this uh, broadcast. Um, and thank you everyone who is joining in. Um, I'm Chelsea Dade, the creator and executive director of Communicate for Health Justice, um, which is a health communications nonprofit that focuses on mixing health equity and social justice concepts into healthcare editorial content and different live programming. And so today, really, really excited to have Kenyon Farrell on. He's uh, an amazing, um, very well-known um, social justice advocate, um, activist, writer, um, you know, uh, leader in um, all things health justice. And so it's a great um, honor to be speaking to you. Um, and I'm really excited for this uh, conversation. Thank you. I'm super excited to be here. Yes. Well, um, off the top, before we jump into everything, um, what is your one word of um, the day? How are you feeling today? Like, what is it about? What? How can you describe today? <laughs> My word for today is uh, optimistic. <laughs> Put it how so? <laughs> well, um, <laughs> one thing is uh, the weather. So I'm, um, you know, I live in Cleveland, Ohio, which is my hometown. I've lived many years in New York City and some in D.C. and New Orleans. And um, it's beginning to feel like spring here. So that makes me optimistic. And, um, you know, I, despite all of the ranges of challenges, I am optimistic that we will see our way out of this current COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, soon. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, those are the things that are, you know, kind of fueling my, my optimism right now. Awesome. And that's great to hear. I would say um, my word is... Maybe thankful. Um, I think there's a lot to reflect on as what you were saying, you know, with COVID. Um, and I think as we get closer to, you know, the, the vaccines that are being developed and um, just we're seeing some positive change. So um, I feel thankful to be here. I feel thankful because there's a lot of folks that are not here. Um, and yeah, I would say that's my, my word. Um, so yeah, well, I I uh, will go ahead and read off your amazing bio because there's a lot in here. You can um, cut you can cut it down because I sent you a lot, but you know. Yeah, well, there's so much great stuff in here. So um, as as I mentioned earlier, um, everyone, uh, Kenyon Farrow, he's a writer, editor, a strategist. Um, has a lot of background in public health, uh, healthcare, social safety net, and social justice. Um, and just a lot of the different organizations that he's been a part of are really passionate about um, issues related to criminalization, um, mass imprisonment, um, homelessness, and LGBTQ uh, rights. And some of those organizations, as you, I'm sure you've heard of them, um, there's PAUSE, uh, The Body, The Body Pro, um, there you have, you're associated with BET, the, the, you know, the, the Grio color lines. I mean, there's so many different notable names there. So once again, I'm very, very honored to be uh, speaking to you about these important topics that are very much related, I would say, to um, what we're seeing with COVID on kind of like the, the equity um, side of it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, um, I guess we'll jump on in. So we talked a little bit about this um, earlier, but um, how did you get involved in public health? What brought you to this space? You know, some days it's a mystery to me how I got involved in public health because, uh, and some days I kind of have to kind of look back and kind of laugh because, you know, as a, especially when you think about kind of public health or, you know, the sciences, math, or the sort of, you know, STEM, you know, disciplines. Uh, you know, I was a terrible math student and a terrible science student in uh, high school. Um, my, you know, energy and uh, interests were more in the humanities. I did well in, in English, obviously. I always could write as a kid. I, um, history and social studies, um, you know, those kinds of, and then of the fine arts. I, I took dance classes as a kid, modern and jazz, and then I later, 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. And I and I waited later, um, you know, I majored in theater in undergrad at Ohio Western University. So um, and I my initial uh, plan when I left uh, undergrad and I came back home to Cleveland, spent about two years here um, working in the theater here and um, ultimately moved to New York where I was also working um, in the theater doing mostly a lot of classical stuff actually. Um, and I, I love Shakespeare and the Greeks um, among other things, but like, um, and, and then I just um, kind of started to get involved in different kind of community organizing and social justice work in New York and mostly initially around kind of uh, work around kind of LGBT youth of color in New York City and, and the criminalization that was happening as a result of gentrification in the West Village in New York. Um, and because of that, and just also being a black gay man and at, you know, in the early 2000s, having so many of my friends either disclose that they were living with HIV or were, uh, you know, had, were recently serial converting, had become HIV positive. Mm -hmm. um, it felt really important to me to um, really focus or make HIV a big part of my work. Um, and so initially I did a lot of stuff around, um, you know, uh, you know, sort of disparities around, you know, prevention and treatment. I was doing a lot of stuff kind of challenging the myths about men on the down low, which was the big kind of national discussion mm -hmm. in the early 2000s around HIV. And, um, and then probably in 20, around 2013, um, I made a decision to really get more, to learn more and to do more work on the kind of hardcore, you know, kind of issues around, you know, science and treatment, um, both in, in HIV, but other infectious diseases, tuberculosis, hepat viral hepatitis, um, et cetera. And really, I wanted to really learn, um, you know, the, the sort of politics around, you know, research and development, how drugs are developed, how they're priced, who has access and who doesn't in the United States and globally, and, um, and also around healthcare access. And then that was around the time when the Supreme Court decided that states didn't have to take the Medicaid expansion, mm -hmm. uh, which I knew, I cried actually the day of that, that decision because I knew how it was going to impact black people because I knew that the Southern states were not going to expand Medicaid and, and most of them still haven't. Nope. So, um, you know, we're 10 years later. So mm -hmm. um, those were the things that really drove me, um, you know, over the course of time to, into public health um, and uh, and then ultimately, uh, you know, into uh, wanting to really uh, also invest my time just specifically for Black people to be involved in the more research and science activism part of, of health, of public health, uh, to, to do that work. Wow. So this is such a great example of um, really what I hope that this platform will be. So folks who are joining um, and listening to this conversation, please know that you you never know what path you'll be on. And that's exactly what you know Kenyon is saying right now. Um, you might enter one space and you might end up in a completely other one and that might be the space for you. So definitely hope you're taking notes um, and just reflecting on you know what, what's being said. So thank you for sharing that. Oh, sure. I can actually say the same thing, honestly. Like, I, I don't have the same um, background, um, you know, and experience as you, but in terms of health communication, I didn't actually, you know, that wasn't the space I was going into directly. Um, and so it does happen, and, and that makes it a really positive thing. So, yeah, and I, if I could, right quick, say something about that. So, on the kind of communication side, not just like both in public health, but then how I've worked in communications and journalism you know, partly just grew out of the fact that um, I was a strong writer already. So when I started, as I mentioned, doing work around, you know, queer youth of color and um, kind of criminalization in New York, I was um, a part of an organization called Fierce, which was just getting off the ground in New York City. And as the issues around you know, the way LGBT youth were being sort of, you know, profiled and targeted in the West Village, you know, we became seen as kind of the public opposition to that. So, um, we needed people to learn how to write press releases, and how, to, how to talk to the media and the press. And so me and a couple of other members really kind of focused on that aspect of the work. Um, and, I, and that's how I learned, you know, really how to, how to work in, in communications, right, strategic communications. 
um, and then grew that into doing more, you know, work in communications for social justice uh, causes. Mm -hmm. And in 2006, I went back to school um, to uh, get a master's degree in journalism. Um, and I was uh, a student at the uh, CUNY uh, Graduate School uh, at the City University of New York. So, um, and I focused on urban health reporting while I was there. So that was also part of the, the tie into, um, you know, both kind of public health and communications. Yes. And that is definitely key. It's like these um, levels to it. You know, you can learn what is public health. You can learn the communication side. You can learn the engagement side, really. You know, engaging people is, is very separate, I think, than the actual concrete um, study of it. Um, and so there are a lot of different like levels and aspects to it and a lot of ways to get involved in, in one, you know, space. So thank you for, for sharing that. Um, let's see. So bringing it back a little bit <laughs> to the same conversation, but um, on a very honest note, um, we talked a lot about like what we really like about this field, um, public health slash healthcare, um, but what is something that you don't like in public health or healthcare, or really, you know, in any of the spaces that you um, have experience in? Yeah, I, I would say um, one of there's there's a few things that I don't like or, or that are the most challenging part of doing this work, and one of which is um, among a number of like kind of issues and institutions in our society, um, healthcare and public health are frankly two of the most kind of paternalistic uh, you know areas of work because. I think specifically if you're doing work in public health or any of the sciences or or sort of STEM, you know, areas of work, there's definitely a kind of, um, you know, we are the experts who know better than you, the mm -hmm. kind of public, you know, non-degree, you know, non-multiple degree, you know, whatever, whatever. And I'm and I'm not a person who dismisses expertise because, frankly, I think we also in this society have too many people talking all the time about things that they don't know anything yeah. about, <laughs> as we see with a lot of our politicians around COVID-19, right? So, uh, and making political decisions based on no science and no expertise in the field. So, so I, that is, I, I want to say that, but I do think that there's a way in which um, what has made it more difficult, I think, for public health to, um, you know, have the real trust of people mm -hmm. um, obviously there are some historical reasons for that but then there's just also um again the way in which people are treated when they seek out health care or, or services but also um you know a kind of uh, a lack of real investment in mm -hmm. community involvement community buy-in and actually the community having mechanisms to hold public health, healthcare, clinical research institutions mm -hmm. accountable for, um, you know, a range of things. So to me, that is one of the most frustrating areas because on the one hand, it's very hard to try to convince and talk to folks in communities about why, say, COVID-19 vaccines are important or why other kinds of vaccinations or, or, you know, medical advances are important and can really help us because people have too many experiences of being in, in those institutions where they were not heard, listened to, or, um, you know, just were outright discriminated against. And so to me, uh, the more we get back to putting the public part in public health, um, yep. the better off I think we'll be in terms of, of, of people really understanding what the work is and, 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 and how it may benefit them and, and, and to be invested in that. Ooh, amen. Amen to all of that. Um, specifically, the notion of bringing the public element back into the space. Um, and we hadn't even talked about this, um, you know, earlier. Um, there's just, well, I, I think the thing that I struggle with the most is that any level of, any level of knowledge sourcing is coming from the community. So whenever someone wants to say they want to do, you know, a study or something of that nature, any expertise really is coming from the community. Um, and I feel like we don't always acknowledge that or have, um, we don't take that, I guess, viewpoint on it. Um, 
and and yeah, so that is it is it is a, a struggle with that. Um, I'm hoping that really with this moment with COVID, um, that a lot of folks are talking more about health disparities or they're trying to learn more about health disparities um, and knowing the difference between a disparity and, and inequity. Um, that's a, a huge part right there. Um, I think hopefully there's more uh, conversation around it now, um, but there's a long way to go. Long way to go. For sure. Um, so then on the other flip of that, um, what is your favorite thing about, you know, public health, healthcare, um, writing about health, mm. you know, anything of that sort? Yeah, I, I would say one of my favorite things about public health and working in public health, either as an a a advocate or, you know, organizer or journalist is, um, is the, the people, right? So mm -hmm. on the one hand, I just got done complaining about the people and uh, a kind of paternalism that happens. And at the same time, I have met doing this work some of the most committed, uh, intelligent, creative, um, funny, <laughs> um, you know, people who really are, um, you know, committed to, um, you know, helping us all you know be able to live um better lives in a way and i and so to me it's it's i really part of the um you know dynamics of COVID is that for a lot of us who you know our work involves a lot of conferences and travel and um you know going to different you know public meetings or scientific meetings etc um you know that all of that kind of got shut down and um you know which i think is uh, beneficial both just for me because I just I like to be able to be in those spaces and connect to people and see mm -hmm. what work folks are doing or see where research is going etc and talking to folks but also um, it's important to the science itself because you know that is it's in those spaces that um, you know as people are presenting their research or presenting work that um, you know you get to see real you know people who have various expertise sometimes community folks who have expertise as a person who have who has lived with a condition or you know lived in a particular geographic area etc and also from you know other researchers or physicians or public health epidemiologists etc to really have a back and forth about you know what the implications of different kind of research uh you know uh findings mean for real people's lives and i think that like it's in those meetings you know i think a lot of times um you know if you're not familiar with the world or you sort of see from the outside it just looks like a bunch of like you know bougie nonsense or whatever or people just sort of flying about the world or whatever and there can definitely be some of that you know extraness yeah. but i do think that there's something about that being in person in that community mm -hmm. of folks and um being engaged in conversation and dialogue that actually is really generative for what research does once it leaves that you know that journal or once it leaves that sort of pdf right when you find it online and i those are some of the to me some of the best things about um doing that work and also being able to see when things are working i'll say that too mm -hmm. that like it's one of the best feelings is seeing you know something that you fought for whether it's a, a program or like you know for prep in terms of hiv prevention you know when you see it in actual, you know, when you heard about it from scientists before public knew about it, whatever, and then you start to see what happens after FDA approves it and then it gets, you know, people to start taking the medication or whatever, and you start to see in this particular case, HIV rates fall, right? Like unless people contracting HIV, like the, it's like when you start to see things that like started out as in like a kind of science research or as like a meeting that you were at, and when you see it implemented in, in the community and mm -hmm. how it has benefited people's lives um, and using PrEP as one example, but that, you know, you could COVID-19 vaccines could be mm -hmm. another part of that. That is very satisfying um, and, and yeah. um, ultimately a good feeling. Yeah, I love that. Um, I never even thought about it in that way of like, it can transfer from the uh, the science, the lab, you know, um, to, to the community and kind of understanding and appreciating that process as well, um, especially with community-based community, community -based research, um, which, you know, is definitely 
I mean, I don't know. I'm, I'm assuming that community-based research is something relatively new, maybe within like, like, I mean, 15 years in terms of like a real study of community-based research. So. Yeah, well, with community-based, like community participatory research, um, as it's often called, um, is actually, is not new. It sort of goes further back um, a few decades, but um, I do think that there are have been bigger pushes for more community-based research um, and or partnerships between whether they be community-based organizations or in research institutions. So that like the questions that people in communities really want to have answered get answered as opposed to, you know, somebody who's a researcher, you know, who's a PhD or an MD, you know, or, or has a master's in public health, whatever, coming to community and say, well, we're trying to understand you know, the impact of, you know, lead in the, yeah. in the, in the water, right? Or something of that nature. Um, and this is how we're setting up the study. This is what we're going to look for. This is what we hope to find out, et cetera. And oftentimes when in that way, the process works, um, community folks are just sort of consulted in, in so much as they're maybe interviewed as part of the study or they may participate in the study if it's a study looking at the effects on the body so that they may be giving blood or, or uh, you know, doing other, other kind of things like that, uh, you know, for the research to go forward. And then the research happens and then they vanish, right, and go away. And um, and then the, the folks who participated or who are from that community, the research took place often don't know what the findings were. And it doesn't move, it doesn't help them move to change conditions. And so community participatory research, I think is really important because it actually gives community folks an opportunity to work with research experts to prove or to demonstrate things in their communities that are happening or things that are needed, et cetera. And then they can take those things and then turn it into a, a strategy for, you know, public policy or legal reform or, you know, or to build new kinds of institutions or whatever the case may be. So I, I am a huge proponent. And I do see ways in public health, more people are talking more about you know, that more bi-directional relationship as opposed to a top-down one being really important. And important towards a lot of things that we've been talking about over the course of COVID really is about community trust in health and science, right? And and I think the more we do that and we engage communities and demystify some of the processes, right, through those kinds of, uh, and then give community back the research that they participated in, um, could go a long way to helping build more trust between communities and public health. Wow, so true, so very true. I look forward to that. I look forward to like seeing the the change, the progress. Um, so, okay, so this this series, you know, for communicate for health justice is titled gentrification in health. Um, I was really intentional about naming it that. Um, and if you know me, you'll know that I tend to <laughs> use like a lot of like, what's the word, like uh, pseudonyms, I think, or like synonyms for things. So um, it can or has a double meaning. So we're talking about gentrification in terms of communities that um, unfortunately, when people, non-people of color move out of those communities, a lot of resources are taken from those communities. Um, you see that in Chicago, you see that in parts of Philadelphia, um, you see that in DC, really anywhere. Um, but the other meaning of that really is ways in which we talk about health. Are we being true to the things that we are discussing or are we trying to make them more comfortable um, or I mean, I don't know, more like appeasing for certain people. And so at Communicate for Health Justice, I'm very you know, open and honest, and that's why I titled it as this. Um, so where do you see these spaces um, in terms of like public health, healthcare, um, honestly, like also with journalism, like where do you see these spaces being, you know, quote unquote gentrified? Um, and then on the public health side of it, um, where, how does gentrification in the, in the physical sense play a role in public health outcomes? 
Thank you. Yeah. So I, the way I would think about um, kind of public health, you know, uh, being gentrified, you know, quote unquote, is um, I, I think one, you have a lot of, of uh, you know, situations where, you know, um, researchers, um, you know, kind of it's kind of back to the, what we were talking about before. It's like the, the drop in to do research on a community. You see this a lot in global health. Um, and where usually white American or European researchers are going to Africa, going to Southeast Asia, going to Latin America and, you know, studying, right, in those kinds of ways. Um, and often, uh, you know, cannot involve other, because there are researchers in those countries. There are, there are African researchers. There are, you know, researchers in Latin America and in, in South Asia, et cetera. And so, um, so I see in, in a way the, that happens, um, you know, in terms of, of public health, but also, you know, even looking at kind of what's been happening in the United States. So in the last, you know, 10 years, roughly since the Affordable Care Act passed, and there was some intentional money that was uh, sort of put towards um, community health workers, mm -hmm. uh, really being able to be in communities and help connect people to uh, you know, to the insurance plans or to do or to, you know, also connect people to health care and, and hospitals and to help sort of translate mm -hmm. health care um, and, and, and health and processes for like, you know, engaging in health care to communities. Um, however, and, and some of that money was kind of scrapped during the, the last four years. Of the, the, Trump yeah, the, the patient so, navigators. Yeah, yeah, like yeah so a lot of the patient stuff. navigators and stuff, which are community health workers. Mm -hmm. were, you know, a lot of the money for, for that was was gotten rid of. But what I was seeing before the Trump administration to me was troubling in the sense that like more and more um, those kinds of jobs of doing community health, you know, health care workers, whether they be outreach workers, doing, you know, HIV testing in communities or getting people connected to care if they were living with HIV or connected to PrEP or, um, you know, other forms of, of community health care work, um, the degree requirements of those jobs was getting higher and higher. So they were going from like, you know, people oftentimes being, coming out of prison or, you know, who don't have a lot of like work histories or whatever um, for various reasons, or who had, you know, had histories of, of, of drug use and addiction or et cetera, mm -hmm. sometimes could get those kinds of jobs because they actually knew how to reach folks who are homeless. They knew how to reach drug users or sex workers or people who um, are often very marginalized. And that could be a real stepping stone towards somebody getting out of poverty and into a career, right, in public health. Mm -hmm. um, but more and more, I was seeing, you know, bachelor degree, mm -hmm. master's degree requirements mm -hmm. in order to be like a, you know, frontline community health worker. And so what what organizations I know were beginning to wow. see when they would put job announcements out for those kinds of jobs is, a, frankly, a lot of like young white women coming out of grad school with, a, you know, they went yeah. straight from undergrad to grad school with a master's in public health or a master's in social work coming into those jobs, right? And cutting, you know, so I think about it in those terms too, that kind of displacement, if we think about gentrification as kind of processes yeah. of displacement, displacing more, you know, working class and folks who have been more marginalized from uh, kind of, you know, uh, works, you know, uh, official kind of work and employment channels, you know, um, from being able to even get a foothold in, in that mm -hmm. work. Um, so that's that part. Now to talk about the impact of gentrification as sort of like neighborhood displacement based on, mm -hmm. you know, white folks moving mm -hmm. from, you know, often suburbs to be back in, in the central cities um, that's happening in virtually every city in America right now. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it has a lot of implications, I think, for, for health. First of all, um, one of the things that it does is if so if there are services that have been kind of connected to those communities and more and more people get displaced from those communities where their basic, you know, social services, healthcare services, et cetera, and they are then displaced to other parts of the city or town where transportation is harder, mm -hmm. where, um, you know, or being able to get from back and forth from work or to an appointment or to, get services, they're being displaced. And so therefore it actually, it creates situations where people don't have as much access to those things. Secondly, 
if those communities or those neighborhoods become less and less, um, there are fewer people, you know, poor and working class people, particularly, you know, black and brown folks who are living in those communities, if, if their population declines and those services that once served more people, they lose funding if they can't mm-hmm. all of a sudden, you know, reach as many people as they used to reach because the neighborhood has shifted, right? Um, yeah. there are a lot of organizations I know in cities like DC that were in majority black neighborhoods, yeah. Um, you know, serving folks, doing HIV prevention work and testing and care, who now the whole neighborhood is virtually all white. And so yeah. people are having, and so they're having to then try to open up, you know, satellite branches in, you know, in Maryland or in like, you know, where, where folks are going. Yeah. So it, it has those implications for people who then can't actually access the kind of services they need or, you know, healthcare, public health or whatever, because neighborhoods have shifted. And, and needless to say something about the kind of psychological impact of that, which um, for folks who are listening, if you're unfamiliar with um, Mindy Thompson, Full of Love, who is a um, public health expert. Um, she teaches at the New School. She has a book, a book um, called Root Shock. Um, that is it's a short book, but it's an incredible way to think about how neighborhood displacement um, impacts the kind of uh, emotional life. And she's actually a psychiatrist, the, the sort of emotional and psychic self of Black people in neighborhoods where you know, all of a sudden, you know, they, their their families and their communities, their their friends are disconnected, um, you know, because of these sorts of processes, et cetera. So I think it, the gentrification, I think, has, a, has an impact on health and public health in ways that I don't think we've really fully explored. Absolutely, 100%. And um, I took a note of the book and the author so I can share that. Um, later um, with all of you. Um, I also mentioned, I'm trying to think of what you had mentioned earlier. Oh, I think um, back to the community health workers and the job kind of requirements. Um, That is very real because I think at one point, I think I'd seen, you know, the minimum kind of education requirement was a GED. And then I, I had seen it kind of increase to a bachelor's and then a master's, which master's are incredibly expensive. And so, you know, yes, I mean, you might be able to get a, a full ride scholarship for a bachelor's degree, but master's, I just have not really heard that, to be honest. And so, um, so yeah, that's a lot to put on someone and then having to get that to even start in a career that you can really make an impact. You yeah. know, it feels very imbalanced. Um, so thank you for bringing that up. And also circling back, um, I'll, I'll make sure we end on like some more action steps for the audience yeah. um, so they uh, have that ready to go. Um, so moving on to um, health communication, this is something we both have this interest in. Um, you know, and you can use whatever definition um, you want of health communication. I tend to use like the CDC version, which is like, you know, basic, um, what is health education? What's health literacy? Um, And that's kind of the standard definition. Um, But where do you see this space of health communication of how to educate people about health um, in the next five years? Where do you see it going? Well, what I hope to see is more emphasis on health communication in the field of public health and healthcare, because I think what we, if if 2020 and into the COVID-19 pandemic, if nothing else has shown us that the um, abdication of, of health communications uh, to uh, communities of folks, large populations of folks across the country uh, helped result in a lot of confusion, and some of it confusion that, frankly, public health has to take some responsibility for. So I would say that, like in the last, you know, year, if we think about all of the different changes in uh, kind of COVID nineteen uh, messaging around, you know, what was happening with the virus and how to protect oneself. So you know, first last this time last year in March, it was don't wear a mask, right? You don't need to wear a mask. Um, Mm -hmm. And then it became, oh, we need you to wear a mask. And then later it became, we need you to wear a certain kind of mask, a certain masks aren't as good as others. And then it became actually, we like end of 2020, early 2021, it was, oh, actually two masks are better than one. And so just like, 
those kinds of like blunders don't help people, especially because the message from the beginning should have been, this is a new virus. Mm -hmm. And we have some experience with the family of coronaviruses, but this one seems to be doing things that we don't quite understand. So we're going to give you some recommendations first that may change later. We may learn things that, that discount what we thought we knew in the beginning. So, so we're learning as much as, and we will communicate with you as honestly and as forthright mm -hmm. as we can, mm -hmm. um, as soon as we can. And if we learn something is different than what we initially said, please bear with us and we'll communicate. Nobody said that, right? Like nobody said that. So, so there was, and then there was the, you know, is it transmitted through, you know, is it airborne or is it transmitted through, you know, kind of respiratory, like, like droplets in the air? Well, for the average person, like neither thing is, is those two right. distinctions are indistinguishable for right. the average person. That is a very kind of hardcore science thing to mm -hmm. figure out. Mm -hmm. The issue for most people is you can contract it from your either breathing or through your mouth. So mm -hmm. covering your face with a mask, your mouth and your nose is what is important. That should have been the message, period. So I say all that to say that I think that what we've learned is that um, not investing in, in solid and smart and easy to understand health communications um, will screw us. Secondly, and, mean, and lead to more public distrust. So by the time we got to talking about vaccines, people were like, well, how am I supposed to believe this works when we've been flipping the discussions about what was risky, what wasn't, how to protect oneself, yeah. what wasn't all along, right? Um, without mm -hmm. clear messaging about why certain decisions were being made. So I think that, and I'm, what I'm hoping is that, um, you know, my, you know, compadres now at the CDC, Dr. Rochelle Walensky uh, mm -hmm. and other folks who were there will be really focused on and our, and, and hopefully Congress will be allocating resources to CDC and other, you know, the health agencies to really do um, more protracted health literacy and communications messaging. And we also shouldn't wait till a pandemic to explain some of these things to people. So it was too late to explain to people how vaccines work, how clinical trials work, how what is a randomized clinical trial, what efficacy is different from effectiveness, all these things that we're now backing into conversations about mm -hmm. uh, while we're trying to like roll out a vaccine that we hope people will take Mm -hmm. It's too late. And so I'm really hoping that it, in general around public health, that we really begin to have some critical discussions about the future of public health, mm -hmm. what we have abdicated, what has been underfunded, and what, what are the things that we really need public health to do moving forward in the rest of the 21st century. Mm -hmm. um, and a huge piece of that, I hope, is going to be about reinvesting in like health communications and health literacy as part of that process. Absolutely. I keep saying that. It's my favorite word. But <laughs> yeah, like investing in public health, investing in health communication. Um, and, you know, a lot of folks who are going to be watching this and who are watching this, um, they might already study these things. But can you, as someone who is a student of public health or social work or something related to health care, can you go to your family member and explain the same things that you're being taught? If you cannot, we need to go back yep. and figure out how to, you know, teach these things. So, um, and there's nothing wrong with that. Like, there's nothing wrong with being, you know, a thoughtful or looking at different critiques of your field or other fields, because um, it will only make us stronger. Um, and I think that we're in a real opportunity for that right now. Mm -hmm. um, so, how? And this is actually a great segue. Um, so. You know, Communicate for Health Justice is uh, very, it's a millennial-centered nonprofit. Um, a lot of folks who follow it, they're millennials or Gen Z. Um, so how can, and, and we have a bunch of different folks who follow the platform, um, but specifically for young people, how can they get involved in social justice, in health equity, um, in a world that sometimes feels like it says, no, don't do that. You know that's not the the way we're we're working, um, or this is not the the status quo. Like, how do young people, you know, navigate that? Really? Yeah. Thank you for that question. So I think part of it there's there's a number of ways. I think one is 
Um, find, you know, I tell all folks who are looking for, particularly who people are interested in, in social justice work in any, any arena, find your people, right? Mm -hmm. Find your people. So um, that can be find the groups and the organizations in your community that are doing, or on your college campus, if that's the case or whatever, that are doing um, the things that you're interested in. So whether that's, you know, if you're interested in, you know, kind of policing and the future of policing and, and prisons and jails in this country, right? Find your people. If you're interested in public health, and there's, there's public health implications, frankly, in all of it, right? But find your people. Um, if you're interested in, um, you know, uh, you know, kind of food access as a part of public health, right? Mm -hmm. Or around infectious disease like HIV, STIs, or uh, COVID, or other things. Find the folks that are doing that work. Second thing is, and or who are doing the advocacy in your community. Second thing is, read, read, read. Now, this is only a, 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 a part of my book collection right behind me. And I don't say that to brag, but it is to say that like, mm -hmm. part of being a good organizer, if you want to think that you're like, whoa, and all these, all other things more than other people, do your homework, right? Mm -hmm. and, and know what you're talking about. There are lots of things, like right now, I'm in a big place where I'm studying like, how the hell, like, how we got the sort of healthcare systems we got in this country, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And why it's taken us this long to get this close to get a single payer healthcare system vis-a-vis -vis Medicare for all. What are the different times in history we almost got there? Who was at the table? What were the things that prevented it? How did it work? You know what I mean? Like, so I, that's like my homework right now because I'm trying to understand these things. So always, and, and, and I'm, I'm 46 years old. I'm, you know, pushing the big 5-0 in a few years. It is, I am never done learning ever. And so, you know, books are a big part of it, reading the news, magazines, and also watching stuff. I Sometimes when I want to learn stuff, I, if I don't have like the books on hand or the articles, I will, um, you know, I'll go down to YouTube <laughs> and look for things that look reputable, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you, see, I, I, you know, also be careful about what you consume and be, and, and be clear about what you're consuming is actually from somebody who knows what they're talking about. Not just because they're speaking to things that you already believe about the world or your worldview, but, is, but do they actually have a base knowledge of things? And so, so then, it, but if you grow, if you're, if you're reading and, and, and viewing multiple sources, you can then start to figure out, well, this sound like some bullshit. You know, what I mean? like you know, you you start to be able to to make discernment. But but I think that's also and so one find your people, do your homework, and then figure out how you can get involved from from those vantage points. Excellent. So find your people, uh, do your homework, and find what was the last one. Uh, I mean, it was really those two. But I would, if I were adding a third one, I would say. Also, if there's if you can't find your people who are doing what it is you think you then you start it, right? And you bring people together. There are a lot of people who start like, yeah, exactly. Chelsea did it, right? Like she there was not an organization focused on, you know, communications for health justice, particularly targeting millennials or younger folks, right? And so start your own thing. Or sometimes if you start a reading group, right? Or a watch group, like, oh hey, y'all wanna I'm trying to really learn about like you know, whatever it is, right, about healthcare. I'm trying to learn about like coronavirus and how it happened. Get your people together and like, you know, watch a bunch of YouTube videos, read some news articles, get, you know, like you can start those kind of things small with a group of people. And now you can even connect people through Zoom or through some other thing online to help you do that if you can't, you know, bring people, you know, bring people together. So, you know, I, I think that's that's also part of it too. The third step for is like, don't be afraid to start where you, if you don't see, mm -hmm what it is that you think will serve you and other folks, start something new. Absolutely. Wow. Powerful. This is amazing. Like if you are here and you're listening and you might want to even replay this because this is just so wise and so helpful. Um, and that's really why I like to do this because I learn a lot in this, in these conversations as well. Um, do you have time for just a few, three kind of quick questions? Sure. Awesome. So um, what is your favorite thing about uh, writing about health? Yeah. Uh, my favorite thing 
uh, writing about health is being able to um, give voice to uh, people and to issues that, um, you know, don't necessarily get the attention that they deserve or being able. So for instance, when, um, you know, I was senior editor at uh, thebody.com, um, you know, I was really happy when we could publish things, either if I wrote it or if I were able to edit other people's writing, um, you know, that really pushed, you know, issues. And, you know, for one example, we published two articles uh, in a, like about a month apart from each other or whatever from two young gay men who had moved to Atlanta, Georgia from different cities. They didn't know each other before they published with us, but both of them had worked in HIV, you know, kind of helping link people to care. They moved to Atlanta and neither one of them could figure out how to actually get into care. And both of them ended up stopping their medications for periods of weeks and over a month because they themselves could not navigate the system. And so when we published those two pieces, it brought so much attention to some of the problems with you know, the care system in Atlanta that it, it resulted. And so I, I love being able to do stuff like that where you can see the real change that you can make through, through, through writing or through editing and publishing. Wow. And that's so true. You know, like telling a story is one of the most powerful tools we have. Um, you know, wow. And that's amazing to even be able to say, like, you know, you were able to connect people and, and kind of expose an important issue in our healthcare system and change lives. So that's incredible. Um, how do you see, oh, this is kind of similar to the question about um, public health and healthcare, but how do you see journalism, the field of journalism changing in the next five years? You can switch it. You can say 10 years or three years if you want. I keep saying five, yeah. but it's up to you. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I am uh, I am less optimistic about the field of journalism for a number of reasons. I think one of which is that there just has been such massive um, disinvestment in uh, in journalism um, in this country to the extent that you know local newspapers are being hollowed out. There, you know, my my own hometown here, at Cleveland. You know, the Cleveland Plain Dealer was an award-winning newspaper. I mean, they would win awards after years and years and years. And mm -hmm. um, in order to union bust, the company that owns the Cleveland Plain Dealer basically fired everybody and, mm -hmm. and, and over years reduced the newsroom. And so when you reduce the newsroom, that means that there's nobody like covering City Hall and going to those public meetings to find out what the hell they're talking about that is, uh, that affects your day-to-day, -day, affects how clean your water is, it affects whether there's a hospital or a or a nuclear plant next to your house. It affects like so many things, right? So mm -hmm. to me, that that's one of the, and I've seen news organizations rely sort of more on opinion writing to make more than actual reporting. And you can do reporting and in, in opinion writing, but I see more reliance on kind of think pieces mm -hmm. more than on actual like reporting and, and mm -hmm. subject area expertise that I think is actually really um, detrimental to the field in a lot of ways. The last thing is that, um, especially around health and public health and journalism that's focused on uh, medical health, sciences, those issues, that is some of the whitest uh, kind of space in journalism, right? It is, it is. I have been to conferences, yeah, like covering, you know, HIV, for instance, which yeah. in this country disproportionately impacts Black people. And I've been in conferences where I was the only Black journalist in, in, the, in the newsroom. Wow. Period. Unless there were Black journalists from Africa or from Europe or from you know other places who were there covering as part right. of an international meeting. Yeah, right. But sometimes I'm the only Black American and, and often the only Black person in the newsroom. And so media organizations have to actually um, get their shit together, frankly, and um, and invest in uh, hiring, um, you know, mm -hmm. black talent to write about health, mm -hmm. and medicine, and science. I can mm -hmm. I I know the few people who do that work um, nationally, and there's a handful of us. But um, you know, so I think, and you know, and, and I have for one never been able to you know write at certain places, like certain places I haven't even written for, who've never taken my pitches. So mm -hmm. you know, I I think that on the kind of racial justice front in order for us to get better health reporting about you know health as it pertains to black people we need more black people 
um, who are uh, doing that work in news organizations. Wow. Well, there, there's a cell right there, everyone who's listening. Um, you know, there, we need more um, health writers that, um, that are black, you know, brown, um, who are covering stories mm. that are from the community. Um, clearly there's a need, so, so we need to get on that. Um, and then you kind of, I guess you kind of touched on this already. Um, in terms of, I guess it could be like a narrative or an idea, but what do you think is missing from current discussions about health? And so this might be written discussions that you see like in journals or um, on different um, news outlets. Um, really any forum, what do you think is, is missing from discussions about health today? I think in large part, uh, mo what we're largely missing in discussions of health are um, things that really point people towards like the, the systemic issues that cause mm -hmm. the range of health disparities that we see, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. um, you know, we spent, so for instance, um, a few years ago, I got really mad at the New York Times, um, a journalist, they actually just basically, uh, I can't remember if he got fired, that they basically forced him to uh, resign uh, for um, something, um, using the N-word in a, in a, with a, a student group in, in South America. Um, you know, in a way that was not like calling people, but in a discussion about who could use it or not, but he still mm -hmm. shouldn't have used it. But anyway, in whatever the case may be, a few years ago, he published a story. It was like around 2014, 2015. He published a story about, um, you know, Black and, and Latinx, young gay men in New York and HIV. And most of the story was spent getting into people's like personal business about like, you know, how they ended up homeless or mm -hmm. on the streets or how they ended up contracting HIV, et cetera, et cetera. Mind you, at the time this story was written um, New York State was about, well, actually at that point, what had already decided to um, move forward with an initiative to become the first state in the country to try to end the HIV epidemic in that state, right, by, by 20, I think by 2020. Mm -hmm. At the time, it was like a five-year plan, um, and which I was a part of some of the work that made that happen. Nice. But so this article did not mention that and did not and so the, the focus of the article was all about these individual young men's you know kind of trauma stories but oh. it didn't ask any questions about well now that we have this plan that the governor cuomo has signed off on to end the epidemic what is the state going to do to make these young men's lives better <laughs> right or to prevent more hiv infections right mm -hmm. or to expand PrEP options or to deal with housing and homelessness in the city, which is a huge driver of, of HIV, um, you know, infection. So, so like I was really, so it's like that kind of thing is missing. It's like, we like to, a lot of the way media sort of writes about health issues when they draw from people's personal stories, a lot of times it just becomes like what, you know, one of my, my mentors used to call poverty porn and trauma mm -hmm. porn and, and like, exploiting mm -hmm. people's personal stories, but not asking any questions about the systems that the folks have had to deal with, the lack of, of support, of health care, mm -hmm. of social services, of a range of things that would have kept them from falling in the gaps in a lot of ways. And, the, and so we need more journalism that is looking at healthcare, public health research, that's willing to not just ask the question about how you contracted such and such or how you got diabetes or whatever, mm -hmm. but let's also talk about where you live. Let's talk about what that looks like, right? Let's talk about what your housing looks like. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about, you know, how many times you were stopped and frisked on the way to work and back and forth or whatever, leaving wow. your house. So like we need more journalism that actually is getting to those deeper questions that don't just make the health disparities we see about individual people's mm -hmm. you know, behavior or their kind of personal traumas, but about people having to navigate systems through which they are often set up to be in situations that will lead them towards, uh, you know, mortality and morbidity. Absolutely. I'm sure everyone's like Chelsea. <laughs> but it's true. It's so true. 
oh my goodness, like the, the trauma porn thing is so accurate. Um, and you actually see that even too, um, I've, I've heard conversations about that with kind of movies and kind of Hollywood, like the consistent showing of black death really, like mm -hmm. um, if we wanna you know, talk current events, um, I, I feel like I do try to always stay informed and on top of you know, everything that's going on but I will be honest. I, I'm really struggling with um, the like the the trial, essentially what's going on right now, and the fact that it is being broadcast um, like live in that mm -hmm. manner, um, because it's a it's a balance. It's like you want to know what's going on, but you also want to kind of protect yourself of like seeing certain things. So, um, and then how does that feel as a black man? You know, yeah. I mean. I, my experience is going to be different. I know for me, when I heard um, of Breonna Taylor, especially we are like around the same age, that hit me and it continues to hit me really hard. Um, but I can't necessarily experience or say I experience the same things as a black man um, who, you know, is seeing what's happening on the news right now. So, um, but there's that balance. It's like, yeah. How People. Yeah, how do we keep people knowledgeable of what's going on and not turning it into, um, you know, well, really also learning how to celebrate, I think, blackness and celebrate um, the culture of it. You know, I, if there's ways to do that, I think, in, in public health and in healthcare too, like we can teach, we can teach people how to do yeah. that. Um, but because we do talk a lot about disparities and we do talk about the inequalities, but at the end of the day, you know, we're a strong people, you know, we made it here for a reason and um, we have a culture. And so there's there's definitely some ways to acknowledge that even in these like, you know, um, areas of academia. Right. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. And I, and I agree that it's a balance because on the one hand, you know, a lot of those videos that happened, uh, you know, whether it's George Floyd or a number of other ones, um, you know, as horrifying as they are, you know, they did actually bring people's attention to what was mm -hmm. happening, right? And and there is something about needing, you know, sometimes we got to witness this, right? And 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 be a witness for for you know the people who suffered and who sometimes often die in those encounters that we're talking about the police. And yet, um, and then, and then there is something about like, what does it mean to the constant twenty-four hour news cycle of replaying and recycling these things over and over? And yeah, similarly to, I mean, just today on the you know part of the trial, I was uh, mm -hmm. you know watching a news story about, and I just I cut down the volume and left the room on. They were showing some newly released video that we hadn't, the public hadn't seen before from that interaction with George Floyd. And I cannot watch it anymore, right? Like, oh, I can't, wow. you know what I mean? I, I can't even, I can't stomach it. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, yes, I, I would agree with you that, that we have to figure out a, a balance there mm -hmm. um, of being, um, yeah, of, of being a witness, but also not, uh, you know, kind of allowing our folks who die to be turned mm -hmm. into, you know, a, a, a circus. A, yeah. And also with that, um, because I had seen, and, and I guess this actually goes back to really the, the theme of this, which is like the gentrification piece. I think for me, I kind of have an understanding of what's going on because I experienced the world as a young black woman. I think there needs to be a way to bring attention to these things in a way that is not going to make people who experience this on a daily have to be witness to it consistently mm -hmm. but it, but it's still out there you know for people to understand because when george floyd happened there were a lot of folks who were like oh i my gosh i didn't know that this was you know a current occurrence yeah a current occurrence and so um i think and now we see it's like on repeat and on repeat and on repeat, which I feel that is not good for my own, you know, personal uh, well-being. So I definitely balance it. But um, but at the same time, there should be ways to highlight it for communities who are not understanding this right. and are not seeing the root causes. Um, so it's, it is interesting. I'm glad we talked about that and also kind of the mental health kind of uh, piece of it, too. Um, 
so that was my uh, that was my last question. I feel like I should end on a more like <laughs> like more. Well, I guess like the action kind of piece yeah. of um, you know, if there's a resource that you want to share, or if it, you know, you can you can just you know say it too because I'll just record it and then I can um, you know yeah. share it out. Um, but yeah, people might want some like resources to to kind yeah. of yeah. So I'll, I'll point people to some a few things. So I mentioned you know from a you know book perspective, the book Root Shock is. <laughs> hugely important to me in terms of understanding public health and mm -hmm. what gentrification and displacement means in the, the lives of folks. Um, so I would check that out. I also would check out, um, you can check out thebody.com, which is a site I'm still a contributing editor for, um, and also The Body Pro, which is more of the kind of science and research of, of HIV and other public health issues there. Um, and uh, my current organization, um, uh, the Partners for Dignity and Rights, which is, and we're, our uh, website is uh, dignityandrights.org. We do a lot of work to kind of help connect community groups um, to build coalitions and really fight for transformative, uh, you know, policy solutions around um, healthcare, community development, um, labor, worker power, and, um, and schools and education justice. Um, so those are just some things. And then obviously, you know, if you want to, uh, you know, follow me, I'm at, you know, I'm on all the things. Well, not all of them. I'm not on TikTok. I ain't, I'm not, I ain't got time for that. But, <laughs> but you know, Twitter, Instagram, you know, whatever, you know, at Kenyon Farrell is just the, is the handle. So uh, check me out. Excellent. So there, there it is right there for all of you to uh, follow. Um, well, thank you very much, Kenyon. I really appreciated this. Um, I hope that this felt, you know, worthwhile, and um, all of everything that you expressed um, really matters for uh, for the audience that is communicate for health justice. So, really, really appreciated speaking with you, and looking forward to following all of your work, um, especially the body. Um, you know, I, I read a lot of great articles from there. It's helped me really understand, um, you know, HIV and, and all of the different um, aspects of it. So um, very excited to follow your work and just thank you again. Thank you. No, I very much appreciate it. And, and thank you for creating this organization, this platform to do this work. I think it's really important. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that, that is it. Unless there's anything else you wanted to add, we um, can end here. Um, but thank you so much, everyone, for joining. Um, and uh, we'll see you next time. <laughs>